All right, welcome everyone. I'm Mike Goudsward. I'm the moderator for this session. We have three papers that will be presented, and each of the presenters has 20 minutes. Um, they will probably roughly use 15 minutes for presentation and then five minutes of Q&A. We have 15 minutes of general panel Q&A for the uh, end of the session. So if you have a question and it doesn't quite fit in that first five minutes, hold on to it. We'll get to it at the end. Uh, all the sessions are running roughly in 20 minute blocks. So if there's a paper you'd like to hear in another room, a good time to move rooms would be during that brief Q&A between each session. I won't be introducing the uh, speakers because they have title slides and we have a short amount of time. So I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenters. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Blackheart. I'm from Columbia University Center for Teaching and Learning. And very glad to be here today after uh, a, a motivating keynote speak, speech this morning. A little hard to follow, but hopefully we're all inspired and um, after that, that presentation. Um, but I'm here today to talk with my colleague about feedback driven iteration um, for a deeper cohort based learning experience in the MOOC environment. Um, and um, this is my colleague. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Jessica Brodsky. I'm a learning designer as well at the Center for Teaching and Learning. And before we get started, I just wanted to uh, emphasize the fact that we're really talking about how uh, the Air, uh, Civil War and Reconstruction MOOC has evolved through multiple runs of the course. We had the opportunity to offer the course several times and we're able to iterate on different aspects of it. So we're excited to share our experiences iterating with you and the different things that we've tried. And we'd also love to hear from you about your own experience iterating on the courses that you're developing and really start a conversation. This is more of a case study uh, with our anecdotal experience and so we hope to hear from you as well at the end. And so before we get started talking about some of the iteration, we just wanted to give you an overview of what the course is that we're talking about. We are talking about our Civil War and Reconstruction X series program that consists of three courses. These courses were based on Professor Eric Foner's residential course at Columbia University that really covers the political, social, and economic changes during the Civil War era um, and after the, the Civil War. Um, and we developed the course in 2014 with our first launch in September of 2000, that year. And um, our second run, we had an opportunity to run this twice, all three courses two times, and that started um, September 2015. Um, the courses were successful. Um, they've been highlighted um, by edX in various presentations and trainings. And just to show you some of the numbers from the course, um, we had uh, quite a few active participants in the courses, both in the first and second run of the course. But I think more impressive are those people that sustained throughout the course. So those who were active in the first week and also active in the last week of the courses we see on average around 60% uh, of people stayed active throughout the course. And we like to think that a lot of that was due to the things that we used to innovate the course. And so shifting over to the course team. Uh, so we kind of consider our course team in two, two parts. One is our content experts. So leading that group is Professor Eric Foner, DeWitt uh, Clinton Professor of History. In the development process of the course content, he was supported by his graduate student, Tim Shank, in the History Department at Columbia. And we also worked closely with Ty Jones at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia to develop a series of activities that we'll get to in a few minutes. There were also a team of 10 graduate students who were moderating the course and monitoring the discussion forums. Uh, behind the scenes, we had the CTL team supporting the course in many different ways, including project management, course design, and media production. Uh, and so it was really a collaborative effort, and we, at the end of each course, would get together as an entire team and debrief what went well and what things we could do differently, potentially, for the next course. And as a course team, um, we, speaking of iteration, we did follow uh, what we call a design research process. This is an instructional design model that we use at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Columbia University. Um, and you can see that it follows a lot of the, um, the instructional design models, the mo most prevalent models out there, um, with a few intricacies. But you can see that it is a spiraling model. And so, you know, once you've started at the analysis phase and looped back to research and evaluation, you know, you're meant to keep going through this cycle. And that's really what we, um, you know, took to heart um, during this iteration process. 
two of the things that we'd like to focus on, two of the pieces that we'd like to focus on in this model during our presentation are the last two. So really talking about the educational experience and how we use those experience to research and um, evaluate the, the participants uh, to make the courses better. So we collected feedback in several different ways throughout each run of the course. The first was informal optional questionnaires that participants were encouraged to complete. We offered them at the beginning, the middle, and end of each course. And the questions changed depending on what point we were in the course, but we were asking students about their intentions, their motivations and expectations, their familiarity with the content, their uh, kind of rating of the effectiveness of different pieces in terms of their learning, as well as also uh, suggestions for what things could be changed or done differently. So being really open to what they wanted to see coming out of these courses. We also used a discussion board uh, and monitored that for technical issues. Uh, the TAs were monitoring for more of the content pieces, but we were there making sure that things were running smoothly. And we also received quite a few personal communications about the course from individual students, uh, both you know, being very excited about the course, but also providing some helpful feedback as well. Yeah, and so what did we learn from that? So we gathered all that feedback and we took it, we really did take it to heart and we, we analyzed what people were saying about the course and what sorts of desires, what works, what doesn't. Um, in the course, and we 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 really focused on two main areas, and I'm going to talk about the first, and Jessica will talk about the second later. But the first area, one of the main pieces of feedback that we received from the evaluation was this desire to to have a small group interaction <coughs> opportunities for that in the MOOC space. As we know, uh, part of the definition of a MOOC is that it's massive, and so how can we create these learning communities that can be meaningful and, and, and an opportunity for students to learn deeply through each other and through conversations. And so three of the things that we experimented with to help facilitate these learning communities are Google Hangouts, cohorts, and study groups. Um, first being Google Hangouts. So we offered at least one Google Hangout for every course that we, uh, every MOOC course, every run of the course. And uh, we did this via Google Hangout on air platform, which allowed Professor Eric Foner to be on air during an hour of time where participants were able to log in, type in their questions, and Professor Foner was able to respond to those questions in real time. So as you can see from our picture, we had quite the setup. Um, we had people behind the scenes helping out um, as Professor Foner um, uh, answered the questions. You can see on the screen up here, um, a, a little um, kind of peek into what the back end looked like. We had our questions along the side here that Eric Foner would read from and um, respond to those questions in real time. Um, the videos uh, of the Hangout were then recorded and so that people could go back and play either one question or the entire uh, interaction again, or for those that weren't able to attend the synchronous activity, they could then um, watch the video of it later. And these were really successful. People were asking for more after, after these. And um, I also wanted to note that we did strategically place the Hangout toward the middle or to the end of the course to allow students to synthesize the information that they've been learning in the course, to ask meaningful questions, as well as to motivate students to continue through the course as kind of the hangout being the, the carrot on the string, so to say. Um, then the other two um, learning communities that we experimented with are cohorts and study groups. Um, cohorts really came from some of the survey feedback 30%, 36% of uh, students that responded to the survey said that they'd be interested in joining a cohort or a smaller interest-based group. And so we um, decided to use the edX cohort tool to build two cohorts for two specific audiences. One being educators. Um, we noticed that through feedback that a lot of the um, participants in our course were K through 12 or higher education educators in history who are using our materials for their courses. And so we really wanted to target them. Um, and then we also had an ongoing relationship with the Columbia University Alumni Association. And that was our second cohort group that we decided to um, 
a prototype and that and um, we had about 65 people register for the educator cohort and about 54 people in the alumni cohort and what those allowed us to do is provide those people with a separate discussion board area where they were able to talk to each other we were also able to send directed communications to these folks as well as publish specialized content to the course that was only available for the cohort. So we took advantage of that and um, uh, put up things related to Columbia University for the alumni and also related to education for the educators. We also used, used that um, to talk about special events that were going on at the university, especially with around Eric Foner. He had a couple books being published during that time, so it was a great way for him to be able to publicize those. Um, then, through the alumni cohort, we directed a study group um, as sponsored by the Alumni Association, and we invited those folks who were either traveling to or living in the New York City area to come to campus, come back to campus as alumni, and sit down with Eric Boner and talk about the course for an hour. And we held that um, event in the evening and had a few people join us to have an intimate conversation with Eric Boner. So some of the takeaways that we learned after doing some of these things is number one, um, we really considered our audience. So in a Civil War MOOC, we figured that most of our audience would be from the United States, but we did have some people from around the world. So we tried to schedule the synchronous activities, especially during times where people could attend. So we really took, um, took that to light and uh, had most of our events during the evening. We also created a detailed set of instructions on how to participate in these learning communities to be able to hit the varied levels of technical abilities. Um, the, num the number two uh, lesson that we learned, takeaway, is to communicate, communicate, communicate. We really wanted people to take advantage of these learning communities that we were working so hard to provide them. So we, um, we set up a Google Hangouts page in the MOOC to, to advertise the special events. We set up a discussion forum for people that were either participating or not in the synchronous activities. And we also used social media and our weekly emails to publicize all of these events. The third, and related to that, is to plan, plan, plan. And so we, we always did a kind of test run of these things before we launched the live. So especially with the cohorts feature in edX was very new to us. So we did a test with some of the TAs in the course as well as some of our T uh, CTL staff before we launched it in the live course. The fourth thing that we took away from these experiences is to think beyond the synchronous event. I mentioned before that we, um, we recorded the Google Hangouts especially, and we also um, took some photos and publicized the um, study group session as well for folks that weren't necessarily able to make it. So we used that video in multiple ways. We posted it to our um, Google Hangouts page as well as YouTube. Um, and we got a lot of views on YouTube um, from those videos. Um, we also included the link to those in our weekly communications and really used those to publicize some of the content in the course as we moved forward. So another aspect of the course that we iterated on was how we were helping students develop their historical thinking skills. And by historical thinking skills, we really mean how we help students learn how to analyze and evaluate historical evidence and then synthesize that evidence into a compelling argument. And in the initial runs of the course, this was done through a series of primary source activities. And a primary source is an image or a document or an object that provides an eyewitness account of the past that can then be used by historians to uh, understand the past. And we set up a set of activities where students were provided with a set of primary sources for each week of the course that they were asked to analyze and evaluate in detail using a set of analytical <coughs> questions that were provided to us by uh, Ty Jones in the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. And these activities were very well received, and I think in part because they uh, built on what students were already doing in the course, which was really beginning to understand the content of the course, but then they were asked to move up 
Bloom's taxonomy, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, to really think about how they can analyze and evaluate that information. So we, see, we received quite a bit of positive feedback about this, but also received requests for more opportunities for students to really demonstrate their understanding of the material and think beyond just the content that was being presented to them. So in response to that request, uh, we worked with Ty Jones uh, to develop an exhibit assignment. So students were not just now looking at individual primary sources, but they were beginning to think, how does a set of primary sources work together to make an argument? And what is the argument that I'm interested in making based on these primary sources? Uh, so students were uh, given a set of instructions for how to do this. And uh, as you can see, we actually have a model exhibit that a student submitted here. And they, oh, sorry. Uh, they've used the uh, three primary sources, included a narrative that explains how the primary sources are linked together and an overarching argument that they're trying to make. So students were uh, allowed to do this in any format as long as they could upload it as a PDF or an image to edX's peer assessment tool. And that was also an opportunity for us to try a tool that we'd never used before in terms of the edX platform. So uh, we were very excited to do this, but also since it was our first time, we had quite a few takeaways from that experience, uh, which include things like you know, extensively testing the new activities prior to their release. So we worked very closely with uh, Ty Jones to develop both the content and the rubric for evaluation. He also provided us with a model exhibit for students to have a sense of what we were looking for in terms of expectations. But then we also had to test it extensively both internally, I didn't touch anything, okay, uh, both internally and uh, with the course uh, content experts and the TAs to make sure that it was meeting the goals that they had uh, described. We also had to weigh whether or not we wanted to make this a graded component of the course and how that might impact participation. So this was our first time trying this, uh, so we made it optional and ungraded. And while we learned a lot of lessons from it, I think part of the reason that we may not have seen as much participation as we would have liked is because uh, it wasn't counting towards the grade. Uh, and so um, that's something that we need to consider later on and also how, very uh, related to the next point, how we integrate an activity like this into learner expectations. Because students hadn't been doing this before, we had to also think about how we kind of ease them into this. And one of the things that we leveraged was actually the Google Hangouts that Andrew described by asking Professor Foner to go live and talk a little bit about his own experience developing online exhibits and the challenges of that and also what he as a historian has learned by doing that and what students can learn by doing that as well. Uh, lastly, we thought about how we're going to apply learner feedback from this exhibit assignment. And while some of the feedback was very relevant and useful, other feedback was outside the scope of the assignment. And we had to think about, you know, what do we address and what do we maybe push off for later. And so based on those two experiences, hitting learning communities and also a deeper level of historical thinking, um, we're going to use these things moving forward in our future MOOCs at Columbia University. Um, we have a few MOOCs coming up this year and next year. And we're hoping to play around a lot of experiment with, I shouldn't say play, because nobody's having fun here, right? Um, the, we're looking to push the Google Hangouts to the next limit. Um, we're looking to also push the peer-to-peer -to, -peer to be a required portion of the course, to be required to the, towards the certificate, and then having hopefully more participation in that. Um, we're also looking to experiment with the idea of learning pathways, so providing different pathways for people to experience con the content in our MOOCs in edX. And, um, and then we're also looking to push cohorts as well, looking into the Teams feature at edX now um, to find out more about self-formed online teams and providing more opportunities for people to have their own study groups in their own local areas, so coming up with facilitator guides and things like that. Um, and so we're really excited about all of these things, and we are excited to talk to all of you about them. So feel free, please, to reach out to both Jessica, myself, and the rest of the uh, Columbia University team um, to talk about these and other things. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, we have time for one, maybe two questions. <laughs> yes. Hi, so you just mentioned um, experimenting with different pathways for uh -huh. people to learn. What do you think that might look like? Well, we have a couple of prototypes in the works now. Jessica and I are both working on new courses where we might use, use something like these. Um, but one idea is to have an image of the, a content map for people to, to experience the content outside of the linear course progression. 
Another idea is to have um, learning pathways built into the videos. And so to be um, presented you know, halfway through a video with different forks in the road, so to say, um, to be able to select um, what uh, works, you know, what you're most interested in. So we're experimenting with lots of different ways to do this. Are you working with Eric on that so that you'd have some sort of expert from the historical side in terms of what makes sense to, for sequencing? Yeah, so exactly. And maybe Jessica could talk about this a little bit more. So we're working on another history MOOC as well, and it's a very close-knit collaboration between what makes sense as pathways and what is kind of uh, you know true to the content, but also what how do we address the fact that students come to these courses with a wide range of interests and needs, and so helping validate those as real pathways that they can take through the course uh, and uh, kind of have a, a built-out experience through that as well. Could you go back to your project management slide? Uh, your teams, not the content person, but next one. This yeah. one. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so clearly this course on the Civil War, in terms of your team, course design, are you working on one course at a time, or six courses at a time, or you could give me Mul some sense of that? Multiple courses at a time, um, multiple other projects as well. Um, but yes, um, I would say, I would say, you know, we have about five in the pipeline right now and six slated for next year. Give me an off the, off the cuff estimation. What's what's ideal for you in terms of being effective? You don't want to be spread too thin, you want ideal or <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Ideally we would love to work on one MOOC at a time. Um, realistic but, but realistically, you know, it, we seem to think that, you know, the three to five mark works pretty well. Um, we're able to experiment and use some of our uh, work for one move with another. And are there other course design teams, not just your team? There's other there's other personnel besides you doing yes. this as well. Okay. I'm exactly. just trying to get a sense of scale for supporting the sure. structure. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Please uh, join me in thanking our presenters. And we will have more time at the end for uh, questions, and feel free to have your questions filter into lunch, which is right after this. So. in Israel. I'm here to present, <coughs> I'm sorry, some findings of a master's thesis research um, now being reviewed in Tel Aviv. I'm also a research assistant at the uh, Duke University Physics and Math Department here in, well, in the U.S. in North Carolina. Personally, I'm stationed in Rockville right now in Maryland. Professor Rafi Nachmias was the advisor of the thesis, also from the School of Education. And Professor Renan Plesser from Duke University hosted, or rather led, the MOOC that we were researching. Uh, he was a collaborator, not part of the research. We like to keep things separate. Uh, this course ran in three cycles, roughly 178 enrolled, about 7,000 uh, uh, completed graduators in all three cycles. And we were trying to ascertain whether serendipitous learning can occur in a MOOC environment. And before we look at before we try to find serendipitous lear learning and charge in, we were trying to ascertain whether the conditions for serendipitous learning exist at all, if there's anything to look for. So serendipity is not a new concept. Excuse me. That is not a new concept altogether. The term serendipity uh, in, re in relevance to unexpected or unplanned uh, gain, valuable gain, was coined over 200 years ago. Many of you probably have experienced serendipity. If we look at the history of science, scientific revolutions occur through an interrupting event where a, 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 a researcher is looking for one thing, ending up finding something else instead or in addition, which turns out to be quite valuable, maybe even more valuable than the original uh, discovery sought. We walk into a supermarket sometimes, wanting to buy one item, we end up buying three, four, five, and of course, some of us perhaps experience the serendipitous opportunity. You walk into a bar with some friends and have a drink and you end up with a job offer. Who knows? So these things do exist in the daily life or documented in daily life from the 80s onwards in research. 
Unfortunately, serendipity is still somewhat regarded as blind luck or randomness, uh, uh, finding things without seeking them, a pleasant surprise. Or if you look up, you know, if, if you look up serendipity on the Google uh, search engine last night, you would have seen the occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way, aka fluke. We all know what fluke is. But can the chaos be controlled? Or in the MOOC setting, or specifically in MOOC learning, can we present our learners with serendipitous gain or serendipitous learning that will be valuable and be reflected to them in a way that, dare I say it, reduce attrition, will keep them hanging on, persevering through the end, or maybe not consider this was like a completely waste of time. I just got what I needed, but in fact, I could learn a lot more. So there was some previous work done on serendipity. Fine and Deegan and Foster and Ford uh, helped us lay down the uh, uh, theoretical framework for their research. They said serendipity is less luck and more conditions. You have conditions within the individual experiencing the serendipitous, having the serendipitous experience, and you have conditions in his or her environment. Is the environment prone to serendipity? A supermarket, for example, is very encouraging serendipitous purchase. Amazon, for example. But I'll get to these examples later on. McKay, Beat, and Tom's. Uh, on work from, two, it should be 2004 actually onwards, it's, it's, it's work in progress. They were looking at serendipitous, sorry, conditions which could precipitate serendipity in an online environment, in a digital environment rather. But they were coming from the information acquisition point of view, not from the learning point of view. Kanha and Fine and Deegan looked at the serendipitous conditions within the individual. Okay, so if the environment uh, could precipitate serendipity is the individual prone to serendipity. I mean, you will need a, uh, an integration of, of these two realms. With regard to serendipitous learning, there's been very little research, if at all. I brought two uh, scholars here to research um, efforts, one by Sawai Zumi et al. Uh, in 2007. He came up with a serendipity course in academia. He told he taught his students about serendipity, and then he asked them to uh, document serendipitous learning experiences within the course itself. It was a one semester course. And Buchheim in 2011 looked at microblogging and tried to ascertain whether or not people learned something while interacting in microblogging. We use the three phase methodology. We tried to combine everything together, but really just dipping our toe in the water here. So we were looking at the extrinsic conditions for serendipity as described by McKay, Pete, and Tons. We were looking at the intrinsic conditions for serendipity as described by Fan and Dean and Kanha. And we also tried to collect as many records as we could of serendipitous learning experience. Because tracking serendipity is very hard. It's fickle, it's slippery, it's very difficult to plan, and it's Sometimes you're right in the middle of something and just stopping and writing down what exactly happened is not the best thing you want to do at the moment. We relied on several definitions. Serendipitous gain would mean a, a meant for us an unexpected and unsought advance. Serendipitous learning, and that's a little bit tricky here. The definition of Buchan was learning through gaining new insights, discovering interesting aspects, and recognizing new relations which occurs by chance or is byproduct of other activities. The activity here, participating in a MOOC. The underlying words discovering interesting aspects, that's what we focused on. Try to keep it simple, the narrow definition of it, gaining new knowledge, gaining interesting, valuable knowledge, and um, I'll get to what valuable means in a second. Conditions for serendipity are those conditions that, when present, increase the chance of serendipity. We asked the students whether or not they learned something beyond the scope of the course. We did not define the scope of the course for them because, because different course leaders have different descriptions of scope. There's no one certain definition. So we left it to the respondents to, to think of what the scope is and then answer our session. No? And uh, the same thing with valuable gain. I didn't tell the respondent what a valuable gain would be for him or her. So we just left it to them, also relying on the respondent's point of view. We start with the extrinsic conditions. 
So there were my, five main conditions which, when integrated into a digital environment, could precipitate serendipity. And since this is a master's thesis, we had we were not allowed to have a huge artistic license to change whatever the literature presented to us. So we just stuck, we just stuck with the definitions um, and guidelines in the literature. So we were looking at the ease of browsing. If one person is prone to serendipity and they feel like making a, a connection between two topics in the, in the, in the uh, course content, how easy would it be to go back or forward and re-familiarize yourself with the topic. So we're looking at the ease of browsing, the number of clicks required to browse between course topics. We uh, categorized, I'm sorry, presenting the unexpected, that's another condition laid down by previous work, uh, how much unexpected material will be presented to the uh, learner. So we were looking at the external links to going outside the Coursera uh, webpage, how much would they uh, introduce new irrelevant material. I'll just go ahead, that's okay, I'll, we have a lot to see here. We also analyzed internal links to provide different formats of, this, of similar content in the course. We looked to identify a recommender system which could perhaps give visual cue, a visual cue to the learner and uh, try to get their attention to do something else, well, learn something else, I should say. And we looked at the concept of stoppability, how many clicks will it take for someone to stop the learning process, go explore something else, and then come back. So this was just a, a, an evaluation of the course uh, GUI. This is the main course webpage. 95% of course content was in that webpage. Uh, we took an offline snapshot, used professional review, property checklist, click distance, uh, and visual inspection. All in all, the uh, serendipity score of the system of the, of the course website was five out of ten, which is fifty percent. You know, so so. The system enabled enabled connections in the sense that you require less than five clicks to browse through the entire course content. Um, it didn't so much present the unexpected according to our definition. Less than five percent of course uh, external links led to something that was not. I didn't say it, it was an astronomy course. So we were looking for non-astronomy links. Um, it did present some variety, medium to high. 72% of the external links led to similar content in different formats, thus allowing, allowing the learner, if they missed something in one format, say while listening to a streamed lecture, maybe they will see what they missed on a PDF slideshow. There was no trigger diversion encouraged. There was no recommender system. And if you were a curious person, it would have been very easy for you to stop what you're doing, explore, and then come back from the, to the same point where you stopped, like if you were an, an, an asynchronous learner. We moved on to the intrinsic conditions within the individual. So there were three uh, intrinsic conditions we focused on. The capacity for by association linking two matters or two topics that are seemingly unrelated, uh, having the capacity for insight, completing a scheme or just having a penny dropped, if you will. And the third one is the paradox of control. The paradox of control dictates that, that usually when we do something, we want to have control. We want to complete a task to achieve a target we're looking for. In order to make serendipitous gain, which again could be more valuable than what we originally looked for, we need to let go of that control for a little bit. We need to keep an open, an open mind, uh, have a prepared mind, and allow for the interrupt, for that interrupted experience that will present us something far more valuable than what we're looking for. We asked ourselves, is the learner prone to linking seemingly unrelated topics? Does the learner tend to seek explanation when encountering information? Do they tend to explore? And did the learner have a meta plan for learning, saying that, yes, I do want to increase my knowledge in astronomy. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. I'll enroll in this course to increase my knowledge, and we'll see what happens. So we ran a survey, seven-item questionnaire, um, quantitative and qualitative uh, questions. We had scholars 
uh, looking at our survey, uh, we had a linguistic review. We embedded the survey in the MOOC environment. We had 19, 978 respondents, which is a less than 1% rate. Our method was non-parametric tests. We looked, uh, we used Kornbach, Kornbach's alpha and the Mann Whitney tests to prepare the data. Naturally, our alpha was low because we were not testing similar topics and we had a, a small amount of questions. Uh, we did discover bias using the Mann Whitney between responses uh, of uh, some cycles, like the one and two cycles and the third cycle. We can't, ex we can't account for this bias, but maybe future work will. And these are our correlations. The null hypothesis was that there were no links between the variables we looked at, so I'm just showing you the rejected cases. We found a link between self-inscribed capacity for by association and self-inscribed capacity for insight. And we found correlation between, again, self-inscribed capacity for insight and whether or not the learner had a meta plan for learning. Yeah, right there. It's not high correlation but it is significant. And that probably means that there are other variables that are hidden and we should find them in future work. Then we looked at um, reports of serendipitous gain. Have you learned something valuable? Have you gained valuable knowledge beyond the scope of the course? Um, we were able to correlate the quantitative responses for that with by association and with the capacity for by association and the capacity for insight. But only in cycles one and two. Once again, there was a bias. There was a bias with cycle three, so we we examined that separately, and we found no correlation. Phase three of the research uh, regarded collecting records. We uh, had two open questions: one, if you gained any valuable knowledge, please uh, uh, disclose it. Not disclose, but uh, please uh, comment here. Um, and we had another open question that asked for additional comments, just to make sure we can track even more data, even if they forgot to put something in question number six, and maybe question number seven will, will make them see the light. We ran trial coding cycle, evaluated and revised our categories, then ran the main analysis using a coding sheet. We ended up with 488 dis distinct verbal descriptions of serendipitous experiences. Um, compared to tens or dozens in previous research, all the research that was shown here previously, and you can look it up yourself. So we were very happy about that. That was a pleasant surprise. Uh, some examples of what we got, some of the qualitative data that we got. So serendipitous learning, as described by Buham, uh, according to that definition, we got 244 records, for example. It helped me enrich my mathematical knowledge as well. Serendipitous gain, just generally, some, some things that are not learning uh, from the area of skill. I improved some basic math and physics skills. People uh, develop traits. I gain more confidence or improve their traits. People were active to perform some actions. I proved to a hostile supervisor that an anchoring point he was attempting to build was unsafe and needed engineering oversight. That was done by um, using math learned in the course. Insight. People gain insight about the, space, the, the, the place of mankind in the cosmos, for example, about the place of mankind occupies the, uh, in the cosmos, and feeling a personal sense of satisfaction. These are examples of serendipitous gain that learners experience while or during or after taking the course. And we are talking about uh, some of these comments uh, were made or uh, made, provided by people who completed the course in 2012. That was the first cycle. Our category three looks like this. Serendipitous learning, what we were looking for, it, uh, can be divided into two subcategories. One, when people indicate that it made me refresh my mathematical knowledge or uh, learn so much uh, astronomy or knowledge from uh, college, made me refresh that. Most of the comments regarding serendipitous learning did not mention whether it was refreshed knowledge or not. We would like to think that it's fresh, not new, something I learned something new in addition to astronomy, but it would be an assumption, so we just label it non refresh and we can look into that later on. With serendipitous gain, you have the numbers there skill 67 comments, trait 14, 
action 57, insight and emotion 81 and 25 respectively. Now, before the conclusion, I'd like to provide, to provide some caveats, of course. Um, yours truly performed the evaluations and the categorizing. Naturally, we could not use external uh, coders for this project. Our construct validity and internal consistency could be questionable. We didn't have a lot of time to run the survey before the Coursera system was shut down to the students, and it was very important for us to embed the uh, survey sheet in the MOOC environment rather than leading them to, a, to an external uh, environment. We are relying on respondents' opinions. Sample could be biased. In fact, there is, I don't think she's here. There's a, a researcher named Naba, Nada Dabach, and I hope I'm, present, I'm, I'm pronouncing it right. She found, she's in this, in, in this uh, uh, conference now. She found that MOOC learners are a biased population. They can activate, activate a computer. They know enough English to learn. They can at least you know, learn online. Minimal interpretation of records, what you just saw, we did not interpret it in any way. We asked, have you learned, have you gained valuable knowledge beyond the scope of the course? If someone wrote math, and that's it, just one word, math, we saw that as gained knowledge in math. <laughs> no, interpretation, no interpretation, a very broad definition. That's because we didn't have the chance to use clarification uh, uh, or in depth, run any in depth interviews. We just didn't have that chance. We didn't have an IRB approval for that. So we didn't do it. Our conclusions the studied MOOC possess conditions for serendipitous gain. Correlated reports on learning traits and serendipitous gain, by association, the capacity for by association and insight, insight and control. Serendipitous gain was. Uh, Report on serendipitous gain were associated with, correlated with by association, and again, serendipitous gain with the capacity for insight. Other serendipitous gain variables remain hidden, will be looked at in future work. This is our work in progress, I should have said. Serendipitous learning and serendipitous gain could emanate from, a MOOC, from MOOC participation. It's good to know when you plan your, like you said, plan, 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 when you plan your next MOOC, you might want to think about what else you can impart the student with. But that will either make them stay, look at your MOOC more favorably. Most of our respondents saw themselves as possessing serendipitous traits um, and to have made serendipitous gain while participating. MOOC learners, our MOOC learners experienced serendipitous learning as defined. MOOC serendipitous gain extends beyond learning. And collecting serendipitous gain records in a MOOC environment is possible. That's just some partial bibliography. There's more where that came from. And thank you. All right. Please join me in. So we are at time, and we'll uh, hold questions until uh, after the next presenter. If you'd like to, this might be a good moment to stand up and stretch and wake yourself up. If you're nodding off, I'm going to. for teaching and learning called the university and concurrently I'm also a um, EDM student at Columbia University's Teachers College um, and so uh, this uh, presentation is a little bit about my aspiring research as well as a, uh, a learning designer with and many of you know industry-wide that's also known as an instructional designer so the practice of that so a little bit about my research as well as my practice And that's the introduction slide. 
All right, so uh, in recent years, there's a lot of research around MOOCs, uh, as you all know, and there's been a lot of exponential, or there has been exponential growth of MOOCs, um, in the, and, and yet um, it has provided some challenges as well as some really great opportunities uh, in, for the field of instructional design. Um, one of the challenges uh, relates to uh, something that I experience as well as uh, my colleagues, and that is the, the, increase, the increased compressed production plan of MOOCs, uh, MOOC development, um, making sure that it caters to the diverse group of uh, large audience sizes um, and uh, also the, um, uh, the types of knowledge that needs to be created, the content knowledge. Um, but at the same time, uh, with some of my initial uh, literature review, um, I was not able to find enough information around the, the specifics of uh, skills, methods, and knowledge that instructional designers need to successfully employ uh, so that the MOOCs that they are developing are, in fact, very successful. So I developed uh, my methodology. is a two-phase methodology. Um, the first phase is uh, where I am currently. Um, so the first phase focuses on semi-structured interviews with US-based instructional designers, uh, and that includes universities, museums, um, any other NGO that's um, based nationally for now. Um, and thus far, I've conducted eight interviews uh, to date, and um, I have uh, worked across four different organizations, um, and uh, the, in terms of the average, a number of MOOCs that they've developed are around three. Um, and then the next phase would be a qualitative uh, survey among instru instructional designers nationally. So here is a, a table of the interviews that I've done. Um, as I said, eight thus far. Uh, three of them were at Columbia University, one at the United Nations, three at MIT, and one at the uh, American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and that's the breakdown of the MOOCs that they have developed. Um, exactly. All right, so then uh, this, these are my preliminary results. And before I give you the results uh, in, in, in specifics, let me tell you about the, the questions that I've been asking the interviewees. Uh, the questions are four. One is uh, how long uh, they have been an instructional designer, how many MOOCs they have developed, um, and then two very cognitive uh, thinking-related questions, which is uh, describe your experience developing your most successful MOOC, and then describe your experience developing your least successful MOOC. Um, and thus far, I have uh, organized or categorized, um, uh, or I've kind of combined what came out in, in those interviews. And by the way, those interviews were done by phone, um, as well as uh, in person. So uh, in terms of skills, communication skills were uh, mentioned uh, quite a bit, uh, project management skills, and technical skills. So HTML, CSS uh, knowledge, uh, platform knowledge, and uh, in particular, most uh, um, or all of my interviews have been using edX, so edX was mentioned, and then video editing skills. Methods uh, that were mentioned, iterative design, which re uh, relate uh, very well to uh, various instructional design models, such as ADDIE, backward design, um, and uh, actually there are a number of them, uh, Pebble in the Pond, there's, there's a number of uh, uh, instructional design models, but iter iterative design was uh, very uh, mentioned quite a bit. Uh, backward design, as well as evaluation and assessment methods, nothing in particular, but that those were mentioned. Um, and then uh, also related to knowledge, it, it was uh, amazing. Someone actually mentioned constructivism. Their approach was construct constructivism, and, and so that was really interesting to hear. Along with that, in terms of theoretical knowledge, was Bloom's taxonomy, learning theories, so then it gets a little bit broad, learning theories, educational theories, and subject matter expertise. So with that was a little bit harder to de delineate what, what they meant, and of course, as a um, aspiring researcher, I knew that I couldn't ask them any other probing questions, so uh, that's where we're at with, that, with the knowledge uh, aspect. Um, and then, um, so currently it, it's preliminary, and so uh, basically I'm hoping to, um, in per perhaps uh, another month or two, uh, reach uh, 
uh, at least about 15 to 20 um, uh, interviews or, or get at least 15 to 20 interviews done so that I can actually um, uh, be able to uh, get some type of saturation in terms of the, the specific skills, knowledge, and methods that, that um, I'm trying to get out of the, um, uh, the interview is related to instructional design. Um, but expected contributions in the long term uh, would be to inform curriculum development for instructional design project, uh, programs, to inform professional development for instructional designers such as myself, uh, because I'm also fairly new to it, um, and then to inform instructional design practice in general. So that, I, th I think these areas relate well to the theme uh, of this particular uh, session, which is related to em emerging um, um, technologies and themes related to the development of MOOCs. Um, so I'm hoping that this could be a, a contribution special specifically related to instructional in the field of instructional design. So that's all I have. Um, and then next steps, of course, are to continue to do the interviews, as I said, um, and then after that, then uh, phase two would happen, which is to develop uh, and pilot a, a qualitative, sorry, a quantitative survey. That's it. So we have time for questions, if anyone has a question. Yes. Hi, uh, Josh Kim from Dartmouth College. Hi. So in your research, I'm just wondering if you're getting out, one of our goals for our uh, program is really cultural change at our institution with this idea that um, faculty work with teams of colleagues, partners, non-faculty educators, and that we kind of try to cement the kind of caste system that we live in through higher ed. And, yeah. and we're, that's really why we're kind of doing this stuff. And I'm wondering if your research can kind of get at that kind of cultural kind of change and what, what a MOOC can do and how that affects the lives and the work of instructional designers. Yeah, and so, so you're, you're speaking to really about the different types of collaborations we could potentially have. Uh, so currently, we, myself as an instructional designer, work with the client who obviously is a, is a faculty member and the client typically comes with a team of project managers and, and, and TAs. Um, and then of course I work uh, under the advisement of my directors and supervisors and so it is definitely a, a large team internally, and then of course we definitely have our partner organizations such as edX or Coursera, and we are working directly, someone from our team is directly communicating with uh, um, project managers or instructional designers who are working uh, for those partner organizations, and there's a lot of collaboration and communication happening. And so thus far, from my experience, it has been pretty effective. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm, Culturally, like the, the, your, your question was more related to culture, and I'm not sure if we are thinking, we're not there yet. We're not thinking at that level right now. I think our goals right now, because of the, the compressed schedules, and uh, within every, I think within six months of a plan, we are you know, launching MOOCs, and so I think it's, it's a little bit challenge, challenging right now to be as reflective and thinking, and really think through about the cultural uh, understanding of the collaborations we're having. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Could you go back to your, to your slide seven, please? Sorry. Thank you so much. Also, I really look forward to your results. Of, of, of thank your, you. Thank of you. Your research. This is your dissertation? This is, a, um, I'm an EDM student, so it's, it's a master's, master's thesis. Yes. Yeah, master's thesis. Yes. This is uh, interesting that this is sort of the preliminary results. And do you have a sense already, just really sort of anecdotally, yeah. that you, you're in, in a way you rank the kind of the thing that, yeah, those, that MOOCs that, have a course design and have a learning design that comes out of the uh, premise of constructivism most likely will uh, uh, you know, present quite a bit of a pathway for productive learning. So I was just wondering um, what that means to you already a little bit and is there already a sort of an intrinsic critique in there of what is going on currently in the teams that are, this is not a critique, this is just thinking about it, in that we're sort of in a loop of, well, yeah, if we want to move forward, do we also need to really train the, uh, the uh, learning designers, the instructional designers, the teams in, in more updated ways of what is actually going on in, within learning as well? And so that's just it's very, very interesting to me, and maybe you have a, a, few, more, a few more comments to make. Yeah, thank you. Um... So yes, this is definitely um, not in, in order of importance, but definitely constructivism is is high up there person for, for, for me personally, and and through 
the years of, so I've been an instructional designer for about, uh, over three years and I've worked with a lot of fellow instructional designers and have recently luckily been able to interview them. And um, what's interesting is that we do have those conversations. We do talk about educational theories, learning theories, when and how in terms of development of MOOCs or any other type of online course. And so those conversations have happened. They've happened a lot. And luckily, through my um, education, I've also taken a, a course on in, um, instructional design. And from that course, I was able to um, go through a, a lot of uh, uh, research that, that focused in on the types of knowledge that are best and most effective for instructional designers or learning to, de de designers to embody, to, to do the, their best work. Yeah. Yes. I'm just curious, how did you define for your research uh, what an instructional designer is? Was it by training, by title, by function? Um, who's in and who's out? Yeah, great, great question. So I did some industry research, uh, and so across other industries, technology, um, outside of uh, uh, academia, it's called an instructional designer based on the books, the, the, the literature that I found. And then uh, within academia, the, the role has developed and changed, and recently the, the running title is learning designer. And I think that learning uh, designer is directly connected to cognitive science and the development of um, uh, cognitive studies in education and around learning. Um, so uh, it's just based on just uh, you know researching, um, kind of doing LinkedIn related search as well as uh, uh, Books and, and research that I that I found. Let me try one more time. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The people you interviewed, do they have training in instructional design? Oh, um, so I didn't ask that specific of a question. I asked. Um, I basically made sure that when I reached out to them, that was their title. Yeah. Yes. Are you noticing any similarities or differences, or do you have any thoughts on uh, learning designers, instructional designers in academia, educational context, and also maybe in like corporate learning? Because I, I say this, yeah. reading a lot more literature now, um, talking about learning in design teams or learning in development teams within corporations, and then using a lot of this similar language. But I'm curious if, yeah, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, and I, I, I think. I, I, it would, the more interviews I do, I feel like I, I'm actually going to have more knowledge around that. And the differences between learning designers or, uh, or uh, instructional designers in the nonprofit sector versus those that are in the corporate sector and the types of training they do and the types of knowledge or skills and methods they employ and if there are differences. And that actually would be very interesting to find out. Um, if I limit this research to just individuals working in NGOs, I'm not sure, it, I, I think I would have to go to that next level, right? A phase three where there's some type of a, a follow-up survey or some other type of um, um, a study that kind of does some comparison study. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah, and probably very, a good contribution to society then. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's just, it's great to see, I think I echo similar thoughts, like it's great to see that like, these are what, what you're finding. You know? Yeah, it's actually, uh, very interesting, um, and in fact, I also, uh, these are my main um, um, audio or in-person interviews, but I did have some also uh, interviews that were just done by email, which I didn't include because I, I don't find the email was, I don't, I, I thought they weren't worthy, but those were my initial interviews, and they didn't result in anything, so initially I wasn't getting the data I was looking for, but then I, I kind of, I, I think that when I started having the conversations, and, and somehow individuals just started sharing more through the in-person communication and the, and the phone calls. And so that was, I, I felt like that kind of helped it get into the, in, 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 uh, help define the, the different categories better and help them kind of open up and, and share their knowledge about it more. So that, that was good, yeah. All right, thank you. I think what we'll do now is we'll move on to the next phase of this session. And I'm going to do something a little different, so I'm going to flip the panel. Um, so uh, our, you have a, a chance to ask a question of anyone on the panel. But first I want you to turn to the person next to you or a couple people next to you and come up with a question together. So it might synthesize some of the ideas in these talks um, or something that we didn't get to. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, have we crafted any questions? You're being so social. Who has a question for the panel? Anybody? Oh, Adam. All right, we, we have a question. We have our first question. Um, okay, so the, the question that, that Josh and I were banding about was, it's very clear from the panel and from all the research that everybody's looked at that, that when you're dealing with online education of any kind, uh, course teams are the only way to make it work. However, um, as we know, on-ground institutions, course teams to attack a specific course are relatively, are in the minority. So one of the questions is how, not if, but how do we uh, bring the expertise that has been developed in the last 20 years in developing course teams and approaching learning uh, with a group of people doing the teaching and teaching not being just the person in front, but everybody behind. How do we bring that to our on-ground residential experiences on campus in a way that can have the kind of impact that we see? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some people in the audience. <laughs> Our director's here, by the way. Maybe. I just, well, I wanted to say, and this, is, this isn't directly related, related to your question and comment, but um, we are really at Columbia University, and I'm sure many of you as well are looking at a lot of what Sarah Heen was talking about and, uh, you know, looking to train our course teams to, to handle not, not only instructional design in general, but um, MOOC development in particular, and course development in general. Um, and, and also to, at the same time, um, onboard faculty who will be working on these projects in a way that can accelerate their, you know, sort of learning curve to course to design and development um, in the online space. And so we're looking at different ways that we can offer um, workshops and institutes to these folks that are going to be new to course design and online design um, through those means. Yeah, and what's, what's nice is that, uh, I don't know if you've looked into it yet, but edX is, uh, um, is creating actually uh, content focused on uh, faculty that are interested in developing MOOCs. So it's, there's content on your first on your first MOOC, how you develop that step by step. There's also uh, content on video creation and video editing. So all of that is kind of now. At, 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 I think they are thinking about those things and and also being mindful of, of providing support on the ground, support to us, so that faculty can come come to us or partner with us or actually have that content, review that content, and then be ready to partner with us. I think one other thing that I just want to add is part of, it, part of the initial conversations is really addressing some of the misperceptions around what MOOCs are and what MOOC development is. And I think, you know, in past working with faculty, I just want to make the videos. I, I have my content, I just want to deliver them in a video format, when in fact a MOOC is really an opportunity to rethink the way you're designing your whole course and created in a way that it has never been offered before. And I think having that conversation first and really going through that backward design process, what are my objectives, how am I assessing, and then identifying the activities. That really is the kind 
kind of at the core of making a successful MOOC and taking into account the kind of situational factors that have changed from your face-to-face -face kind of residential course to the online space is really kind of at the heart of making a successful learning experience. So. And I think that loops back then to the way that they teach their own uh, uh, residential courses. We see um, faculty members that we've worked with really be enlightened by this process of like, oh, I never thought about that for my for my uh, course at on campus. And so I think it's it's a, a cyclical process. Okay. Uh, I was just going to follow up on, on, on those comments. We, we, we've done a whole process to take a lot of courses and a master's at SEPA and put them online for people at the global centers uh, overseas. And the process, obviously the professors, it's a lot of time the first time that they're having outside people come and really work with them and look at the whole process. So I think a lot of times they, it's, it's a battle, but they often, I think, see it, get a lot of interesting insight in that process. And we're also, our SEPA is now moving all into a Canvas platforms, a lot of classes that haven't been uh, available with any audiovisual elements or assets are now going to hopefully have them. So I think that we're also, we've, we have a lot of classes we deliver both online and also face-to-face, -to -face, the same content, and we're, we're, we're increasingly developing some elements that they can use, not as a fully flipped class, but they could, it's an audiovisual case study or it's a lecture with a guest, special, you know, an expert in a certain content area who only comes every now and then to campus. So I think people are starting to see more convergence of, 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 of the processes. So that's something that we hope to see more. I want to make room for anyone on this side of the room. I don't think we've heard a question from uh, this side of the room. Uh, the last, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so we were going to ask um, how many people in the room, by the definitions that you were talking about, how many people in the room have the, either the title of instructional designer or learning designer or essentially do that all day, uh, even if you have some other title? Uh, so how many people did that? And then how many people had explicit training in that before you started doing it? So we're doing a little polling? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if people are willing. How many people have the title of instructional designer or learning designer? All right. Someone tallying our... <laughs> and uh, how many people have training in that field? You're all going to be contacted to be interviewed. By <laughs> uh, any, any questions from the center of the room? Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, back to the team question. Uh, uh, some of the folks here from the team that I belong to. Uh, I, I think we've been doing content creation for a long time, even before MOOCs. And the team aspect of it was always in, incredibly important. I think the part that we're now reaching is what is the, t the team that is needed for a particular move? Uh, for example, uh, maybe to use a sports analogy, um, is that um, we, we want to make sure that the team that we're generating with the faculty uh, is not filling a similar role that the faculty might play. So if the faculty is going to play a goalie role, we don't want to put another goalie in that same uh, team. The way we're going to try to approach that is we're going to have a, a uh, and we're thinking about how to create a uh, MOOC uh, course design uh, process before we even get started on the MOOC with the faculty so that they begin to think about the change from teaching online uh, and residence uh, to online. And by doing that, we A, prepare them better for getting ready for this process, but two, it will hopefully expose the areas that that, uh, that course will need a lot of help so that we won't put a, uh, a second goalie in that same team. Because I think the teams in our MOOCs have all been very different. And, and, um, and, you know, and I think getting as much success out of each of those teams is really important to us. Any, anybody on the panel want to respond or affirm? <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I think what we'll do is I'd, I'd like to give another round of applause to our presenters that are wonderful <laughs> for, for seeding uh, ideas in our conversations that I'm sure will spill into lunch and throughout the next two days. Um, we're getting out early, that, which means we're first in line for lunch. So uh, lunch is back where we had breakfast. Uh, see you around and please continue these conversations. Thanks.